Hi, thanks for coming. Um, thanks to South African College of Applied Psychology for inviting me. It's good to be here, good to be talking among people who know something about the psychological field. Um, I noticed that I was going to be talking in the, in the next room, which actually was um, a room dedicated to Viktor Frankl. And I was thinking last night that Viktor Frankl, you probably all know, put forward the idea of a world to meaning. A world to meaning meant that the, that the world to meaning transcended the drive, Freud's drive towards sexuality, Otto Rank's drive towards status and power. Um, <coughs> Frankl said that the world to meaning stretched beyond that. But the difference between those two drives, the, the power drive and the sex drive, is that they kind of push you from behind, they impel you, whereas meaning is something that stands in front of you, Frankl said, and you decide whether to walk with it or not. And Frankl himself um, had gone through the Holocaust and he had developed his logotherapy during the Holocaust. And, um, he said, we've always got a choice, and in spite of the horrible situation he was in, he said, we can always choose whether to love or hate. <coughs> and I was thinking, yes, well, in that case, if, we've, uh, if you've got a horrible partner, uh, if your partner is being horrible, you can still choose to love and hate, especially Frankl could have done that in the Holocaust setting. But anyway, that's... Um, that's Viktor Frankl. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm basically, my radical stance is that I want to, the, the centuries of romantic love that have been, that have validated romantic love as it is something that I'm, I'm trying to wipe out. And um, there is a sort of elusively, ob, elusively obvious fact I want to point out to you that sort of, um, illustrates how this perfect bonding of a of, of two beings, a man and a woman, has gone down has, through the ages, has been symbolized through the ages. So the yin yang sign, the yin yang symbol, is puts together a, a man and a woman or two opposing forces and, and meshes them perfectly. Now the elusively obvious thing about this is there's two beings, like two human beings, are incredibly complex human beings. The only way you can put two complex human beings together is that they do not mesh in some sort of easy, perfect form. If a motorbike and a vacuum cleaner are tried to be meshed together, they just not get, they're too complex to be meshed together in a sort of cuddly, blissful bond. You'd have to melt them down, reduce them to two simple dimensions in order for them to, 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 to be together in this beautiful yin-yang sign. So I'm suggesting the yin-yang sign is sort of proof of the belief in this perfect union between, between two people that works perfectly and it doesn't speak of the, the multivalence, the, the, more, the more complex cell. So complex another nature. obvious fact that I just noticed was um, Hermann Rorschach, the guy who organized the Rorschach test. Presumably most of you know the Rorschach test. Um, the Inkblots. Hermann Rorschach, by the way, was called Inkblot at school. Now, if one wanted to make a vague stimulus for which people must project their, their innards on, um, I made up something like this myself. Um, so, you could see here the posteriors, you could project onto this, here's an open side, here's a closed side, there's, there's a node there. So half of me is open, half of me is closed, etc. You can project all kinds of things onto it. But the point that I'm trying to make is that Rorschach created a thing, created ink brush in which the left side and the right hand side fitted each other perfectly, very much like the yin yang sign. So he was projecting from his unconscious mind, he's projecting this perfect bond. Um, anyway, so um, so just want to talk about ambivalence. 
Um, so apart from this perfect bond, uh, what happens in, um, I guess most of you have learned also about uh, ambivalence, the dating, um, sorry, Melanie Klein, good breast, bad breast, good mother, bad, bad mother. The, um, the baby does not know initially that these are the same mother and the attainment of ambivalence, what Melanie Klein calls the attainment of ambivalence means the baby gets to know that the good and the bad are in the same mother and that's quite an achievement in terms of child development. So um, I just want to then talk about ambivalence in our dating. Um, in our dating we, we, we just feel ambivalent towards everybody we meet until we meet our true love, our soulmate. My book originally was going to be called The Soulmate Illusion, by the way. Um, Anyway, at some point in time we meet the perfect partner and suddenly all ambivalence disappears spontaneously and, um, and we're in love and I mean, I, I am holding images of the, the, all the great romances that you might have had or, or that you see in the media like the Kardashians and these people. Um, so, um, yeah, okay, that, that's enough about ambivalence now. So I'll. Um, I just want to say two ways, so, sorry, what happens then is after, after the romantic period then, then, there's a, then, then ambivalence comes back, eventually ambivalence comes back, that's the sort of what we know and um, conflict arises and it has to be dealt with, so this is sort of from ambivalence to true love to ambivalence again. Now this I'm suggesting there's two ways in which love is blind, in, in two ways in which we don't see where the magic comes from. You know, I suggested that it's like, romantic love is like seeing a magician. Um, we, it's all magical because we don't know the real cause of what's going on. As soon as we know how a trick is done and what is underneath it all, it doesn't look so magic anymore. And I'm suggesting that um, a romantic love is like that. So. The, um, there's two ways in which love is blind. One is the popularly known way and um, the second way is my thesis is what I'm trying to present as, as something new, <coughs> as a new theoretical structure. So, the po so let's just talk about the popular way. Um, the, so the popular way basically says this romantic love is some sort of what I call a perfect fit or a beautiful blissful bonding and um, slowly I, I want to talk about two realities that this that romantic love wakes up to. It wakes up to an imp that there's actually the fit is not so perfect. It's an imperfect fit and conflict develops. So that's one that's one reality that that is woken up to. <coughs> um, just want to give you the Greek, some Greek words for love that you might know. The Greeks had about six or seven words for love. Um, I'm just going to give you three of them. There's eros, which means erotic love. There is um, ludus, which means playfulness, playful love. And there is pragma, from which the word pragmatic comes from, which means adult, adult, serious love. And um, I'm going to suggest that I do suggest, in fact, that the romantic love is the the real bonding, the glue of romantic love is really based on eros and ludos. It is based on on a child child likeness that is um, that is beautiful, erotic, and playful. Um, now the other the other waking up the other waking up. Oh, uh, so I've written here the childish and the childlike. The reason I put the childish as well is because part of the theory says that the that romantic love is a recreation of the good sides of, of, of the early years with mother. And I'm talking about the first two years of mother that, that are a very big element of it. But um, when there's, there's also wounding and there's also frustration of needs in childhood so those things cause wounds that go up with us um, and so 
there is the childish as well involved in, in, in connecting with somebody. And, and anyway, so I'm saying we fall in love with a lot of elements of these and then we have to wake up to an adult pragmatic reality and a lot of romantic loves. A lot of romantic love downplays this. They might, they might still see it, but they downplay it. It's less important. The glue is here. Um, this year is totally denied when you're in romantic love. It's like, hey man, we are, we are going to be in love for, in this bliss forever. Very much like, like the child, when everything is happy with the with mother, everything <coughs> seems as if it's going to last that way forever. Okay, I have just one more drawing. I, I'm not a technophobe, by the way, but um, I, I don't mind these old ways of doing things. I find that there's no, the texts don't flow. They don't disappear off the screen and things, all kinds of funny things. And I had made them up when I first did my first ever lecture on this. Um, let's see if we can get stands up. So what I've, what I've done is put those two, I've, I've put those two images together. I've put those two images together. In other words, this line over here divides a perfect fit from an imperfect fit. And this line over here divides adulthood from childhood. So I've, I've drawn up what I call four quadrants. Um, and I'm suggesting that this is the quadrant where this, the sense of perfect fit and it's a childish, childlike sense, I should say, ludos eros, and that is a romantic love. And, and romantic love is going to wake up to the reality of conflict. And I've divided the conflict here into adult conflict and, um, and child conflict. In other words, what I'm saying is that the childish conflict is when my needs in the relationship are not being met, so it gets very personal. It's very personal what, what happens between us. It's all about me and you. Whereas um, the adult conflicts are more about values. So, so yeah, I said regress conflict, personal needs and things like that. You don't satisfy my needs and you make me angry, therefore, etc. Yeah, value, yeah, the adult needs are about values. Um, the ecology, how to bring up kids, um, politics, things like that. And then, and then I won't say much about adult thing now. Um, so, so this is roughly, so, so the, the, the important point that I want to make here is that when this is going strong, it generally the, the popular view is that this here is fine. From the movie Casablanca, there's a song that, as time goes by, that says the world will always welcome lovers as time goes by. And, um, and that's what we do, you know, we see lovers, we let them cross the street before us, we let them into the door, things like that, we hail them. And, um, and then, so there's no problem yet, but later we know that they'll wake up to all these other problems, so that's, that's the popular view. Okay. Now, my view, my view says, wait a minute, I think there's a problem here already, and um, the problem here already is that we are dealing with a projection of the early bond with mother, well, let me let me put, let me use these words first. Um, sorry, just let me go back one step. The the popular view is that the the problems come here and they have to be sorted out. So the therapists do that, and then your friends and you try and sort this out, and, and that this is fine. But actually, this the suggestion is actually this has got a lot of what relationships are really about, and there's a lot of potential here for connection. And, um, and over here there's a lot of problems. Okay, so let's get to those problems. So my, my first sentence about that is that, that that romantic love is an overreaction. Now, um, actually it's a strange thing to say because you probably learned, I, I really don't know what you guys learned. I wish I knew more about what your courses were about, but um, 
you, I assume you've learned things like an overreaction is, um, is often, a very strong reaction is often an overreaction. Um, and it, it's based on, um, it's, but it's regressive. Overreactions tend to be regressive. They can be based on some sort of early childhood rule or thing that's coming up in you. And in dealing, in trying to be, be useful with, um, with your own overreactions, is you need to press the pause button. So that's the sort of that's the way I was taught. I, I don't know if you, you sort of read the same vibe, but to me that's a sort of general vibe within psychology. And um, the reason it is an overreaction is because it is a projection. It's it's a total misperception of what's going on there. And um, it is it is a projection of perfect bliss lasting forever. The projection of perfect bliss lasting forever is a recreation of the bliss of the mother-child bond in the first two years of life. Mm. So that's, that's the thesis that that dramatic love is brought of that. So what are we blind to? We, we, uh, the, the, there's two ways in which we're blind, and the one way is we project. Projection in the wider sense of the word is we put something onto another person that isn't on them. I'm not going to go into the complications around the concept of doing whether it's me I'm putting on you, or whether it's my, mo my mother, because me, me is not my mother. So if I put my mother on you, it's not putting me on you, but it is my mother. <laughs> so, um, so that putting something on another person that is not on them. And then the second thing is around that all is a whole load of things that are them, that are the, 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 the adult developed self that I don't see. Now the reason I, I, don't, I don't see very clearly, and the reason I don't see it very clearly is that firstly it takes a long time to unfold. I cannot download myself to you in one, you know, in one fell swoop. It takes time to get to know people, so that's a simple fact of life. But secondly, you might not reveal yourself very well, so you reveal some things about yourself later. Um, and the third thing is denial. It's like uh, I, I can see the type of person you in the in the just in the shadows I can see certain behaviors, but I just ignore them because I want to concentrate on the bliss of the love. So um, these are two ways in which we these are ways in which we uh, don't see properly. We don't see the other properly. Now the I. In my book, I've called, I said there's certain qualities of, the, of, these, of this projection of perfection. This projection of perfection has certain qualities that, in romantic love, that seem to mimic the childhood state, the baby state. And that's, they just seem like the patterns there seem very similar to the patterns in romantic love. So that's, that's really the, the essence of, of my book. Um, there's, there's lots of ideas in my book about all kinds of things, but this is the, the, the main thesis. If I was writing a thesis, it, it would be this. So I'm just going to take you to some of those um, elements of regression and suggest those similarities. Okay, so um, um, there's a state of... Um, it, it, romantic God is a state of preambivalence. In other words, it's a state of the baby when the baby just everything is wonderful, so it doesn't even reach the state where the switch to to mother is not so good has happened. And um, then, secondly, narcissism. Narcissism means um, the baby does not know that the mother has a life outside of fulfilling its needs, and thinks <coughs> thinks that. The mother is just there to fulfill my needs. Now, I'm suggesting that in romantic love there's a similar sort of thing, although as an adult I do know that you have needs outside of your needs to fulfill my needs, but I kind of vague them out. They, they're not important to me. They, are, um, <coughs> they don't register on my mind as very significant, so I don't, I don't treat them very significantly. Um, there's a flip side of this as well with, say, codependent people where I am, I need you to be needy. Um, I need you to need me. I, I am parent, you are child. In, in the first case, I am child, you are parent, and that might happen both ways. I'm talking transactional analysis here. So the second case is, I am parent, you are child, and I know, I, you, 
I need you to need me. And I think that every single need that I fulfill for you is all that you need. But I don't know that actually there are needs that you have that I cannot fulfill. And this is extreme narcissism. Um, there's an extreme case of this that I, I, re, I don't know if you guys know about the, the criminals, Ridge, the Cray twins in, in English East End here. Um, the Ridge Cray was totally in love with this young girl and um, he really showed his love, his true love by like beating up anybody who looked at her, etc. And um, and he showed it by marrying her. He clearly was hooked on her, and he was, as I know, he was faithful, even faithful to her. And um, this is a criminal who runs a night, uh, running nightclubs and things. He did not allow her to choose her own food or her own clothing. <laughs> he, uh, it's like, darling, you, hey. I'll buy you, I'll, I'll give you the food, show you what you must eat, show you what you must, you must dress. Strangled her, she had no independent life of her own. One year after the marriage, she committed suicide. Duh. So, um, that's a good example of that sort of narcissism. <laughs> the, the third thing is dependence. Um, dependence oh, means, pendere means, uh, means to hang from, and um, I go into quite a thing here in the book about dependence. It's, um, the basic thing about dependence is that mother, baby is very dependent on mother. Mother is big. And I go into the phenomenology of big and small. You know, Napoleon was a small man, but he was a big man. And there's different kinds of dependency, like factual dependency and emotional dependency. So I don't want to get into all these complications here, but um, I'm suggesting that in, in romantic love, um, the lover is, uh, you are big to my s small, I'm small to your big, and, and, and it might be the same for you for, in different areas of life. And how do I know this? I know this because there are these endless array of songs, which presumably are projections out of the, right, the psyches of writers, and so many, which is, you are my world, and I cannot live without you. And there's a song by the, the Celine Dion, Dion um, I'm falling into you, I'm falling into you, catch me, you, you know, which means you're bigger than me. And uh, you must hold me, I'm small and I need you to be big and hold me like that. So I'm suggesting that that is, that is a regressive state. Um, boundarylessness. Um, the baby doesn't know where he begins and mother ends like totally merged with another end. Happiness, my happiness is mother's happiness and vice versa, but I don't even know what causes what. There's, I don't know what, what causes this happiness, um, and I don't give a damn because when I'm happy, I'm happy and that's all I care about. I, I, I was remembering actually the state that I would call a Pollyanna state, it's like, um, I imagine most of us have experienced this, I certainly have, is when you're depressed and down and anxious, the whole world looks that way. It's like you look at people and you see the tensions you've got inside you, you sort of see in them and you see their misery and the pain and you know. And, but then suddenly if you get happy and maybe you're caught enough, suddenly the world is a totally different place. Now, the world cannot have changed because of your mood. Everybody is still exactly the same as happy and miserable as they are, but it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant example of just how, how perception um, that, uh, makes us see what we see reality that, that, that is an illusion. Um, so there's no sense of who is doing what to who. Now, in a, in a, in a, in a romantic, um, in a romantic um, setting, the, the conflict then breaks down this, this, this beautiful, beautiful bond and uh, suddenly then we have to start figuring out who's, we start then figure out, we start the separation process and that's kind of the good thing about conflict. Um, so who, um, now we start figuring out who is doing to what, which might be because we want to know who to blame for the misery that's going on, or if we are a bit more responsible, like you guys,
organizing this room would be, it's like being on what's, who's responsible and then who needs to do the work and things like that. So that is a sort of growing up process. Magical thinking um, uh, in the psychology, psychotherapist, narcissistic omnipotence, it means um, the baby thinks that needs just get fulfilled magically. It's like if I had a need, it gets fulfilled when it gets fulfilled. Um, so the, the same with, with romantic love, it just seems to happen so beautifully, passionately, without having, um, without needing any skill. Um, I've kind of put together the sixth and the seventh because I often don't know how to separate them and this is what I call the instant recognition of um, special uniqueness. Um, have you ever thought that um, love at first sight is what happens the moment you walk in? Your mother sees you for the first time. There's a kind of love at first sight. But um, uh, 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 a woman called Anne Murphy Paul, I think her name was, has written a book called Origins. Is anybody heard of Anne Murphy Paul? The book Origins. No. She's, you know, she's the, she comes up with amazing things about how the bonding of the baby in the womb with the mother, for instance. The, the baby knows the mother's voice and the, the, the fetus knows the mother's voice, lives with this mother's voice vibrating inside and once it gets outside we can prove now that it prefers that voice to any other voice. So there's an incredible, and the smell of mother and things like that. I mean you get the same thing with baby seals and um, penguins and things like that. They, they, penguins and seals, they all look exactly the same. There's no uniqueness. But mother, among thousands, their mother can tell their own baby by, by its smell, unique smell or unique calling or something like that. And I, I think it's a brilliant um, image of just uniqueness based on a very simple and simplistic connection. Um, that's, that, that is very simple. So, um, the, the uniqueness of um, that, that love at first sight and that bonding, that, that, that bonding is an inst it's a recognition and, it, and it's love and it's a blissful bonding. That it's not just a recognition, it's a recognition with incredible love. It's, it's true love. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, maybe I am a bit of an incurable romantic. All I know is when I go to when I go to movies and I see these scenes where, like, I think of Lane as a marble, for instance. So the hero looks at, across the room and he sees her and he knows they are going to be together and forever. And, they, and then they both go home and they sing about how they're in love and they know this is true. And and I I find myself crying. Believe me, even this author finds so. That's how. That's the path. I have to, I have to kind of, you know, hit myself. It's like that's the power of the illusion. It's the power of the projection. <laughs> okay, so um, those are sort of roughly the, um, the 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 qualities, and, and I go, I, I I describe them in, in much more depth in the book. Mm. So so the question is, what is real love? If that is all illusion, then what is real love? And um, if we if we take that popular, if we look at the, the, the popular view, the least we can say is, you know, real love is, is whole love. It's, it's, it contains the whole reality of the thing, obviously. You know, if you, if you don't love with all, loving in all four of these quadrants, then you, you haven't made it. So the, that does mean that you've got, to, you've got to be really good at dealing with conflict. And I'm not going to be talking about conflict. And in my book, I don't talk about conflict. Conflict that is not my contribution, but what I I do point to some people like Marshall Rosenberg, uh, nonviolent communication, Daniel, um, um, uh, what's his name? Perry, 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 um, da Dana and Perry, um, warriors of the heart. Too. Both these people, their basic idea is that conflict is an opportunity for intimacy, and that I just sort of point that out in the book uh, because because conflict allows you to know the person at a much deeper level. So so it's not really a problem. The problem is not dealing with the conflict creatively. Um, so. Um, real love clearly is not fantasy love. If we're talking about real, uh, it's a real can't be fantasy. Now, I, fantasy is not just pictures in the mind. If you're living out a fan, living out a kind of fantasy love means living out something that is 
the, the small part of your life that is not connected to the to, 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 to the bigger part of you. Um, I won't try and explain it now. I hope you get that. But um, so if you're only living out one part of you, you're clearly this is clearly a fantasy kind of life because uh, it's not connected to the to the whole of you, which is which is already totally inherent here. So all these things are waiting, and they're inside all of you and they, from the beginning. Um, so how we do have an ability, we do have a reflective ability, I've, I've called it an inner parent that, that knows, that sort of knows that what we need to be a whole, we, need, we know we need to deal with all these things, so I, I sort of suggest a reflective consciousness that, that needs to to try and deal with the whole of you, but then I also, by the way, come up with the concept of soul. Now, soul is a very, as you know, kind of watery concept, but this is kind of where I put together the Freudian and post-Freudian view with the Jungian view, with the Jungian spiritual view, because I suggest that I can, this whole picture yet can be can be surrounded by something called the intelligence of soul, and um, and I, go, I, I, I describe what I call soul very deeply in the book, but the basic, the, one of the issues of, of dealing it with soul means that if you've, if you've grown up with a lot of wounds, for instance, um, if you know what you're doing, if soul, if you can see what you're doing, soul, the main point I was trying to make is that soul can, you can enter love by any one of these quadrants when they soul. In people, different political parties have conflict. They find different parts of each other projected onto the other and then find love from conflict. Um, so they can enter here. People can enter by... I've known stories of people who enter in this quadrant. They, they're, they're really involved in each other's crap, you know, in each other's regressions and conflict. And, and, and they... And they, but they somehow they get converted into love. Um, so okay, so real love contains soul, and I've talked about that. And then secondly, conflict, conflict is turned into intimacy. So that's within the, um, that's kind of the answer to the, what is real love in terms of the popular, um, in terms of the popular version. Now I just want to go back to my thesis and say, okay, so what in my thesis, what you got to do now is. Um, is go through those qualities and say what what would how would those qualities be treated in um, in a mature love and then you got it in a mature love you got to get beyond regression and so firstly you you got to get beyond ambivalence um, you've got to you've got to you've got to look at the good and the bad but it's actually more complicated than that I think because I think ambivalence just means good and bad there's just two sides. I think we need to look at multivalence. We are such complicated creatures that we cannot reduce ourselves to that yin yang symbol. Um, and therefore, we have to manage to put together a relationship with quite a complex, quite complex valencies. And, um, and in other words, we have to decide the ability to decide to stick with a relationship is not going to be based on falling in love. It's going to be based on a decision and on the, on the um, ability, the, the, um, the, 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 the knowledge that you can actually, put, we have potentials that we can develop and that we will develop. Three questions I want to ask you under the thing of narcissism is that, um, do we need need fulfillment or do we need to know the other? Am I, do I want you to fulfill my needs or do I want to know you? And um, when I was about 35 training as a psychotherapist, uh, I wrote, I think I've written three good sentences in my life and this is one of them I put on the board, on my mirror. It said, the most important thing about needs is not necessarily satisfying them, but having them acknowledged. So in other words, if you, if you can't satisfy a certain need of mine, but you can acknowledge me for that need, and it doesn't matter what that need is, it doesn't matter how way out it is, you know. Um, in my own experience, that need actually, the desperation of that need even goes down by its acknowledgement, and then it doesn't become so desperate anymore. Um, 
The second thing about needs is um, this, we can also ask a question, do we, our relationships about need fulfilling or need frustration? Uh, those of you who delve in Buddhism probably delve into the whole thing about um, desire is what causes pain and suffering and we must give up desire. So with, when we give up desire, then nobody Nobody can frustrate our needs. And secondly, we, we will never hate anybody for frustrating our needs, so we can have compassion for the whole world by giving up desire. I think this is, I mean, this is all very beautiful, but I think for us Westerners, um, a, a slightly middle way is um, makes more sense. And I would like to suggest that um, that what we need, the state we need to get in, is joy in need, it's just nice to have needs fulfilled. But, and we should have joy, the needs fulfilled should be cherry on the cake. Should, needs fulfilled should be, should give us joy, but need frustration should not lead us into desperation. I think that's a good state to be in. We shouldn't be desperate because needs are not fulfilled. Um, there are certain life issues we've got to solve. Um, For instance, our self-esteem, our our uniqueness, um, our feeling of safety and community and um, authenticity. Now, some people over here, I've got a whole question about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. By the way, because I have an idea, there's a there's a bit of a theoretical issue there that was not seen. That some of those being needs, you know, these deficiency needs that we try and get needs met from the outside, there's the being needs. And um, these are being needs, esteem and things like that, but we can either we can either see them as needs which we must fulfill from the outside or find them in ourselves. I'm sure you all know this, I'm just pointing it out. That um, if I if I, if I cannot I must people think that romantics think that these issues must be solved by the, by the method of finding love. If I find love, I'll be able to be authentic at last. I'll be able to tell you who I am. I'll be able to be myself. Meanwhile, it's so hard to be myself in the world. I have no self-esteem, but ever since I fell in love with you, I've suddenly got confidence, you know, um, and uniqueness. And, um, there's a whole load of these things, safety, safety. And you've got to find those things in yourself and bring them into the relationship as an adult and then you create a relationship of two adults rather than two half people. Um, the issue of boundaries. Um, boundaries. There's an excellent book for Dunyan, D. Union, uh, called Dare to Grow Up, and he's got an excellent, um, excellent writing, a beautiful piece of writing about boundaries. So in terms of boundaries, you need to organize your intellectual, emotional, and physical boundaries. You need to be very clear about that so that you're a separate person from the others. You protect yourself from other people's emotions, other people's physicality, and other people's ideas, and you hold your own boundaries in terms of those ideas. Um, magical thinking. Um, uh, that uh, the magic of the bond formed between us is not based on just something we just fall into but um, and regressive, but is based on all the complexity of our adult life that we, we actually create we create bonds and when we manage to cross the barrier and meet each other that there's a kind of magic in that it's not it's not as powerful and as passionate as the sort of like Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor, for those older of you, <laughs> passionate um, unions, but it's, it's more real. Um, so then the specialized uniqueness, I would say, is about complex, complex adult qualities, you know, accurate perception, seeing the other person as they, as they, they, they really are. So there's just two, two more things I can say shortly about love what is true love. True love contains true and love. Truth is often something that tends to destroy love. But if you can, this, one of the secrets of love is putting together truth and love so that you can be authentic and yet have love there. 
And the second obvious thing is that it is not just the finding of love, uh, but the making of love. So, in the beginning I was talking about Eric Fromm and, um, <clears throat> and that other song which really is about almost about the making of love and I said it's, it doesn't quite fulfill us. So I'm suggesting we put, we've got to put together the finding of love. You've got to find somebody that you think you can make love with and that you have the potential and then you test out the potential and try and, and form a relationship and develop it and grow in that relationship. So um, I'm going to end with the last verse of that song. In the evening of my life, I will walk to the sun set at a moment in my life when the night is due and the question I will ask, only I can answer, was I brave and strong and true to fill the world with love and love. Thank you.